In this series of videos, I will be discussing image acquisition and needling technique in ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia. While I will be focusing on just technical performance, this is only one element of providing successful regional anesthesia to your patient. All of the other points listed here are equally important and must be paid attention to. There are three basic steps in the technical performance of ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia. The first step is image acquisition, which means scanning and interpreting sonoanatomy with the aim of identifying the target nerves, structures that should be avoided by your needle, and selecting the best view and needle trajectory to reach the target nerves. The second step is to insert and guide the needle to the target nerves, and finally, to achieve safe and effective deposition of local anesthetic around these nerves. In this first part, we are going to look at the scanning phase of ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia which is all about image acquisition and optimization. One of the key things to realize when using ultrasound is that you only see things that you look for and that you will only be looking for things that you know should be there. Ultrasound interpretation is therefore all about pattern recognition. You may not see the dog in this picture the first time, but once it is pointed out to you, you will always be able to identify it. Detailed anatomical knowledge is therefore essential to interpretation of sonoanatomy. Another thing to realize is that when scanning, we are obtaining a sequence of 2D images, and we should be using this to construct a 3D anatomical image in our mind. Again, this is where detailed anatomical knowledge comes in very useful. Using the popliteal sciatic nerve as an example, as we scan along its course, we should be able to mentally visualize the common peroneal nerve as it swoops in from superficial to deep to join the tibial nerve at the bifurcation of the main trunk. Nerves, however, are not always easy to see and identify. However, they have relatively constant anatomical relationships to muscles and fascia, to blood vessels, and to bone. And these are easy to see and identify. So always start any scan by knowing and looking for these easily recognizable landmarks of bone, vessels, or fascial planes. In these two examples taken from the ankle block, we identify first the superficial peroneal nerve by looking for the fibula, in particular, its anterior corner, then the investing crural fascia, realizing that the nerve lies superficial to the fascia in this location. In the second example, we're looking for the tibial nerve in an infected edematous foot. Again, we start by looking for the investing fascia that overlies the neurovascular bundle, and then we identify the blood vessels, the posterior tibial artery and the accompanying veins, which will be respectively pulsatile or compressible. The tibial nerve must then be the vague structure that lies posterior to these vessels. Surface anatomy used to be the cornerstone of landmark-guided regional anesthesia, but remains equally important in ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia. You should be placing your probe where you expect to find the nerves you are looking for. And you should be aware of the course of these nerves, as in general, you want to place the probe perpendicular to the long axis of these nerves. If you don't consistently do this, you will have difficulty with pattern recognition. This example of scanning for the roots in the interscaling groove illustrates this. If the probe is too lateral, you won't see any nerves, and if it is parallel to the clavicle, you may actually be oblique to the course of the plexus. This gives you a picture like this, which is not what we usually expect to see. We are still over the interscaling groove between anterior and middle scalene muscles, but we are oblique to the long axis of the plexus, and therefore, the roots have this oval, stretched out appearance. If we rotate the probe, however, to bring it perpendicular to the long axis of the plexus, we now have the typical hypoechoic circles that represent the roots of the brachial plexus at the interscalene level, making recognition much easier. The next thing I want to discuss is positioning. Hand-eye coordination in ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia is challenging. This is because we are looking away at a screen and not down at our hands. We are also manipulating the probe and needle in three dimensions based on information from a two-dimensional image. This emphasizes the importance of the point I made earlier about constructing a three-dimensional model in your mind during the scanning phase. It's important to arrange the machine, the patient, and where we stand so that everything is in a straight line and we don't have to turn our head or body to look at the screen or our hands. Another consideration when setting up our position relative to the patient and machine 
is to consider whether we want to be needling across our line of sight or along our line of sight. This has actually been studied and the along approach actually results in easier and better needle beam alignment in in-plane needling. It also addresses the issue of hand dominance as you can always set it up to be using the same hand for needling regardless of which side of the patient you are targeting. Related to positioning is the issue of ergonomics. Good ergonomics helps with hand-eye coordination and needle beam alignment. Simple things to pay attention to include appropriate bed height to avoid stooping, standing square so that your shoulders are either parallel to the needle in the along approach or perpendicular to the needle in the across approach and to keep your elbows close to your side. These maneuvers reduce the tendency to drift out of alignment as the needle is advanced. The way you hold the probe is also important. You should use whichever hand feels most comfortable, recognizing that you will be using the other hand for needling. A common mistake is to hold the probe high up when what you should be doing is to grip it low down and have part of your hand resting on the patient for maximum stability. With practice, you want to get to the point where you can control the probe with minimum effort. This means having the wrist in a neutral position and relaxing your shoulder, elbow and wrist. So you've set up your machine, positioned yourself and placed the probe where you expect to find your target nerve. The next step is to optimize your image. There are the obvious things to pay attention to, such as setting the appropriate frequency range, depth, gain and focus on the machine. What is just as important is how you handle the probe and the two most important movements for optimizing image quality are pressure and tilting. There are four basic probe movements. The first is tilting or rocking the probe as illustrated here. The next is sliding, which is the key movement for needle beam alignment, rotation of the probe, and downwards pressure. How much pressure is appropriate? This really depends on what you're scanning for. In ultrasound guided regional anesthesia, you should apply enough pressure that it feels tiring after a while, but not so much that you're hurting the patient. Pressure improves visibility of the structures and reduces depth to the target. In contrast, if using ultrasound for vascular access, you have to practice using very light pressure to avoid venous compression. The primary function of tilting is to optimize the visibility of target nerves. This is due to a phenomenon called anisotropy. Simply put, nerves do not run parallel to the skin surface. So when the ultrasound beam hits it, it may reflect away from the probe rather than towards it. The popliteal sciatic nerve is a good example of this. You can see here that the common perineal and tibial nerves are barely visible. But by tilting the probe to orient the beam perpendicular to the nerve, we maximize the return of the echoes and thus the echogenicity of the nerves. The optimal tilt is the one where the boundaries of the nerve are best defined. Tilting should not, however, be used to try and align the beam with the needle during insertion. It is very difficult to make small translations in beam position by tilting, and the translated distance also varies with the depth of the structures. The primary movement for a needle beam alignment should be sliding. This allows the very fine micro movements that are needed to align two structures that are only millimeters wide. While sliding, it is important to maintain the tilt that provides optimal target visibility. Rotation is a movement that is only used if there is gross misalignment of the needle and probe. You don't have to visualize the entire shaft. As long as you can see and identify the tip, this will be sufficient for safe needling. Once you've optimized your view of the target and surrounding structures, the next thing to do is to plan the needle approach to the target nerve. In this example of an infraclavicular brachial plexus block, the aim is to get to the five o'clock aspect of the artery. At the same time, we must avoid trauma to the lateral cord and the posterior and medial cords. We also do not want to inject too far away from the artery as it results in higher block failure. There are two possible approaches that could be used. One is to pass just cranial to the lateral cord and push it aside with local anesthetic injection. And the second is to pass between the lateral cord and the artery. This illustrates the end point after needle insertion cranial to the lateral cord. Apart from focusing on the final destination of the needle tip, it is also vital to consider structures along the needle path that must be avoided. In the supraclavicular plexus block, 
we often aim to land on the first rib and hydrodissect our way to the corner pocket. What is often overlooked is that the suprascapular nerve may have separated and can lie lateral to the plexus in the path of the needle, placing it at risk of injury. Once again, this highlights the importance of detailed anatomical knowledge. Remember that you only see what you look for and you only look for what you know. Once identified, many of these obstacles can be displaced out of the needle path, either by fluid injection or with careful needle handling. In the next part of this series, we will look at the needling phase in more detail.